Right. Welcome to Unsafe Space. My name is Lou Perez. I'm Toby Morishano. Right. And uh, for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with Unsafe Space, um, we do a comedy show and uh, an expert panel on a very controversial subject. And we've done so many over, the, over our tenure that we decided what is the funniest one we could do Hence, incarceration. It's just, <laughs> there's going to be, you know, just so many drop the soap jokes. It's just going to be so great. It's going to be wonderful. Yeah. And uh, we're, yeah. Our, the other reason we're excited to have you here is to unveil our new logo. Which Guys. Is, yeah. Look at that. Guys. <laughs> Thank you. It, it only cost half a million dollars, <laughs> but it's there right now. Fantastic. So change your tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so uh, the way that it works is uh, we're going to start the night off with um, some stand-up comedy. After that, we're going to bring our comedy, uh, comedians on stage as well as our experts. And then we're going to uh, have a panel discussion on the topic at hand. And what we really love is audience participation. So at, if at any moment you guys have a question or a comment or, you know, a manifesto you've worked years on and you're looking for your <laughs> moment, to just tell the world about it. Um, just step on over here, and then I will bring this microphone to you and stick it in your face. Um, and yeah, does that, that sound pretty good? Sounds good to me. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to need you to put your hands together, because we're going to start the, the night off the right way with my co-host, my friend, Toby Murashanu, everybody. Oh, that's a good nice, nice. Thank you, guys. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so when I was you know, getting prepared for this show, I heard that uh, America has a similar crime rate to most other first world countries, yet we have a higher percentage of our population incarcerated than any country in the world. And when I heard that, I thought, man, how good is our criminal justice system? <laughs> We're just catching everybody. <laughs> you know? Sweet. No, I mean, I think there's, you know, there's some problems with the criminal justice system, but I also think there's some myths, right? Like uh, people act like everyone's just in jail for pot. But uh, I don't know if you know this. Um, 83% of people who are in prison are not there for drugs. And 74% of the people who are, are in there for drugs other than marijuana. And 100% of my jokes are statistically correct. Because <laughs> I figure even if in worst case, if no one laughs, I'll at least bomb precisely and accurately. <laughs> like a smart bomb. <laughs> That's my goal. 0.1% um, of people in the prison system are in there for pot possession. Um, like. That's crazy, right? If you go to jail for pot, your lawyer is as bad as the lawyers we give everyone. <laughs> Honestly, I'm shocked more people aren't in jail for pot. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. If you smoke pot all day, every day, you're not going to end up in prison. You're just going to end up being my roommate. <laughs> my experience. Oh. I, um, it does frustrate me a little bit sometimes how politicized the justice system gets. Because like, I think, you know, uh, Incarceration is a reasonable response, a natural response to crime. But at the same time, sometimes you try to fix a problem and it causes another problem. You know, sometimes you want to incarcerate people as a solution to crime, but it ends up affecting the communities you're trying to help. And as an engineer, that's just how fixing problems works, you know? And I, I don't want to use too technological an example, but like, remember when we invented fire? <laughs> at some point, someone was probably like, hey, fire would be a really good way to keep bears out of the cave. So they tried putting fire in the cave, and then a bunch of people died of smoke inhalation. <laughs> you know? Logical next step, maybe put the fire outside of the cave. But in today's political envi environment, half the people would just be like, nah, you're just being soft on bears. <laughs> <laughs> and the other half would be like, fire's a conspiracy created by the tech industry to kill us. <laughs> That's how it goes. I don't have too much personal experience with the, uh, with the criminal justice system. All, the closest I came. Uh, when I was in grade school, I dealt fireworks. You know, it's true. I was in pretty deep. They called me Sparkler Face. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I don't know. It's, a, it's a dangerous game. I can't count on one hand how many people lost fingers. <laughs> M80s, smoke bombs, you name it. If it was in the shoebox in the back of my brother's closet, I had it. <laughs> that was my source, by the way, the back of my brother's closet. I broke a, a rule, and this rule is so underrated. Keep your family and your business completely separated. <laughs> really? No notorious B.I.G. fans? <laughs> Where is Brooklyn at? <laughs> I broke other rules. Never 4th of July in your own supply. <laughs> That's a harsh one. And eventually I got caught. I got ratted out. I did six hours hard time in the assistant principal's office. 
still bear the scars that are just in, on the inside. <laughs> you know? yeah. I used to live in Rhode Island. So I don't live there anymore. Now I live in Los Angeles, which is much more expensive. Um, like for, in Rhode Island, for $600, I got a one-bedroom apartment. And in LA, for $600, I got nine parking tickets. <laughs> yeah. And it irritates me, you know? Because they don't need to charge $68 for street cleaning on roads that are never clean anyway. They don't need to do it three times a week. But that's just how they fundraise now. Like, if they, say they want to build a new park. Someone will be like, well, you can't raise my taxes. And someone else will be like, well, you can't cut my programs. And someone else is like, oh, I've got a crazy idea. What if we divide the bill into increments of $68 and then distribute them on windshields like the rave flyers? <laughs> how about that? And I, I, I'm really against like for-profit policing, you know. And it, I think that's something that people could more come together on, you know. Say you're listening to a rap song and it's like fuck the police. Well, if you're a white person, maybe you think oh, I don't know. Maybe that's encouraging toxic social attitudes. <laughs> but if they were like, yo, fuck the traffic police, everyone would be like, yeah, I'm on board. <laughs> we're all on the same page. Cool. All right. Thank you guys very much for your time. If you're a little warmed up. It's my pleasure to introduce a very funny gentleman to the stage. Uh, he was a former uh, prosecutor in the Bronx and now is a regular on the Adam Carolla Show. Please give it up for J.L. Calvin. Thank you. How arrogant to just go, well, now that you're warmed up. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, they were getting there, but you can't just sort of declared it a done deal. Uh, <laughs> Oh, let's see, what to start with. Um, I like to tell people this because sometimes they can't tell from looking at me. My father was actually black, uh, but my mother is 100% Irish, so I came out sort of Italian Adam Sandler. <laughs> um, but it's good when people tell me white privilege doesn't exist. I think to myself, eh, the darkest I get is sort of Middle Eastern. And whenever I'm touring the country, if I'm in shopping malls, because I perform only the best clubs, um, you always know when you're, when you're benefiting from not favoring the black side of your family, when you look more Al-Qaeda-ish, because you get a lot of sirs from mall security. Like, I'll see them harassing some black teenager, like, hey, yo, 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 get over here. And then they see me with, like, a backpack, and they're like, sir, sir, excuse me, sir, can we help you, sir? And I'm like, wait, if you think I'm... Carrying something in my bag, shouldn't you be like treating me even more like shit than, uh, than being extra polite to me? I don't know, just a thought. Um, I did work at the Bronx DA's office, um, which was kind of like law and order if you hit the SAP button on your remote. Um, there you go. Uh, it was all right, it wasn't bad. Uh, if I can be honest with you guys, because the good thing about it is having a black father and a white mother, um, it was like, well, who can I incarcerate guilt-free? Ah, oh, Latinos, there you go. I uh, won't be offending either of my parents with this job decision. Uh, it is weird when you work at a job like that um, because you do start to, and I, I've, I see it with different people in my family. I had, a, I had a, an uncle who uh, taught in a rough public school for like 25 years, super progressive guy, but you just see it like eroding, you know, like you're just like, Nah, I'm very tolerant. Ten years in, it's like you start just hearing some of those, like, these people kind of statements coming out of his mouth. I was like, what? And like 25 years in, it's like, get me out of here. Just nuke this place. I gotta, I'm done with these folks. Uh, but if that, it was just, it was, it was Latin names that kept coming up on my list of cases. And at first, you're like, hey, well, you know, it's, a, you know, it's just, you know, you're working in a place where, like, you're only seeing the worst come through. It's not emblematic of people. And that's what you're saying, like, first six months. Like, two years in, you're like, Vasquez, what the fuck? <laughs> Diaz? <laughs> Gutierrez, I'm dating a Gutierrez. Come on, you're shaming us. Uh, so you start to feel, and I think I got out in time to, like, preserve. But you do feel sort of like you start to get... You start to feel a little racist. It's unfortunate because you're like, you have to tell yourself at the end of each day, this is just where you work and this is you're literally seeing the worst coming through. That's the nature of the job. Um, but I was dating, uh, when I worked there, I was dating a Puerto Rican woman because when in Rome. And, uh, <laughs> and it was weird because during the day you felt like, hey, uh, get in jail, Latin guy. <laughs> and at night you're like, have sex with me, Latin woman. 
right? I felt like the Thomas Jefferson of the Bronx. It was very, very unsettling. <laughs> but uh, one of the funny things when I was working in the DA's office, though, was that uh, at the time, this is going back a few years, but the CSI was the number one show on TV. Like that whole franchise was, was thriving. And it was funny to, 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 to deal with jurors during that time because a lot of prosecutors had the same complaint. They were like, uh, you know, yeah, your juror might have dropped out in fifth grade, but uh, he does watch four hours of CBS drama each week, so he's pretty good on law and science. <laughs> so, yeah, I remember my last trial there before I left uh, for the private sector because I was tired of living with my parents and being a prosecutor. That's always weird. Um, Right? Hard to intimidate witnesses when you're discussing what you want for dinner with your mom on the phone in your office. Uh, but it was, it was my last trial I lost, and I shouldn't have. I had done a good job, and I was pretty pissed that I'd lost. So I asked the jurors afterwards, you know, in this CSI culture, you know, just curious, why did you acquit? And uh, one guy just raised his hand and said, no semen. And I said, huh? And he said, what no semen, man, got to acquit. And I said, that's fair. And that's true, there was no semen in this case. Uh, but this was a check fraud case. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, I guess I don't know how much time I have, but probably not much. Good, thank you. Uh, but I'll leave you with this, just it's my, my calling card right now, and I don't know how much longer he'll be president. Um, but I do sort of, and I know this doesn't have much to do with criminal justice or incarceration. Maybe I can turn it. I just, I wish, I could do comedy like Donald Trump ran for president. I think that would be fun, you know? Because instead of trying to make you guys laugh with jokes, I could have just been like, I love incarceration, people. Incarceration, one of my favorite things. <laughs> Basically, we're gonna have such tremendous incarceration when I'm president. <laughs> By the way, I got my attorney general from before the Civil War, okay? Beauregard <laughs> Sessions, come on. Who names their kid Beauregard anymore? This guy's gonna be tremendous, okay? Anytime you touch drugs, you're going away for life. That's our new philosophy, okay? Believe me, tremendous rates, of, and a lot of private prisons. We're gonna really, really do a great job for the private prisons. I love private prisons. They're really tremendous. My daughter is so hot. Uh, you guys are great, thanks. See you in uh, 10 minutes. Thank you. Joe Coven, everybody. All right. Well, now that you're warmed up, um, <laughs> We'll bring up the next comedian, a super funny guy. Uh, you might have seen him in the New York Comedy Festival. Give it up for P.D. Diabra. Thank you, guys. This feels like a TED Talk. <laughs> this is big for me. This is nice. Uh, you just, this unsafe space feels pretty safe to me, I must say. I feel like everybody here has health care. You got see your legs across. You don't care about losing circulation. No problem. <laughs> He's talking about Trump. A lot of people said if Trump won, they would move to Canada. And I was like, I ain't going nowhere. People were like, damn, you really love America. I was like, no, nah, I'm on probation. I can't really. I got to call people to make moves like that. I need people to get clearances and shit. I can't just leave. I saw I love comedy. This is a great job. I do this for a living. Uh, there's no background check. It's beautiful. You just shot on probation when I got the job. It's really good. Uh, I always kind of knew uh, I wanted to be a comedian because uh, I'm from the Bronx and uh, a lot of times like in the hood, a lot of you don't really hear people uh, saying like, I don't know, it's just you got to know what you're going to do. So I knew it was funny because I couldn't play sports, couldn't fight, couldn't rap. So I was just funny. That's how I didn't get beat up and in the fights and everybody loved me. And uh, I'll never forget when I, when I found out the power of a laugh. Uh, I think I was in first grade, and my mom, when you know when they used to call your parents in school, like if you got in trouble, like they call your parents from school at work. So my mom used to beat my ass back in the day, but this was cool when it was like cool to beat kids' ass. So <laughs> they called her and they were like, yo, your son's acting up. And I knew she was gonna beat my ass, but she worked two jobs, so she would come home real late and beat our asses out of our sleep. And again, it was cool back then. And uh, so I knew she was gonna come home and beat my ass, so what I did was I put my gym uniform on, which was a sweatsuit, and I stuffed it with pillows and like <laughs> tissues and stuff, and then I went to sleep. So when she came, like, she came home, she's like, get up, and I got up. 
She said, I looked like a little sumo wrestler. And then she didn't beat me. She started laughing. That's when I knew I was going to do comedy. <laughs> then when I turned 14, I got a gun. And I was like, I don't got to be funny no more. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> now I'm ready to fight. It's kind of a product of my environment, I guess. That's how, that's how I grew up. I used, to rob, like, I used to rob people. That was my thing. I tried selling drugs, but then I used them. And I was like, I got to try something else. And then started robbing people. I remember one time I robbed a friend. Oh, well, it was, like a, it, wasn't, it was a third party friend. It was a friend of a friend that we were mutually friends with. And I robbed this kid. His name was Steve. It's my friend Juan's friend. He got upset when I robbed him, when he found out. He was like, yo, dude, how would you ever rob one of my friends? I would never rob one of your friends you invited to the block without cutting you in. I feel like that's very inconsiderate. I was like, you're right. That's very inconsiderate of me. I don't know. I think crime is whack. Uh, it's from Matt Poole. Crime is whack. At least when you get caught. This shit is terrible. When you get caught, you're like, man, why'd I do this shit? It's fucking dumb. I feel like we could avoid a lot of crime in the hood if there were like really people that looked out for us. And like, I was watching Luke Cage recently, and, and I didn't really like it because he only serviced Harlem. And I was like, what about the surrounding boroughs? There's nobody. <laughs> like, you don't fucking just 138th Street, Harlem to the Bronx is right there. You can walk to the Bronx. <laughs> Never goes to the Bronx. But then I was thinking, like, maybe that's what the hood needs. Maybe the Bronx needs a superhero that could defend us and look out for us. So I thought of one, and I think his name would be, like, Captain African America. And, and he would be cool. Like, he would fly. He wouldn't even have a cape. He'd have a do-rag. It'd be like, shh. <laughs> that's how he would fly, too, standing up, because he got Tim's on, so it's hard to go horizontal. He just flies like that. For the community. That's what we need in the hood. We need someone. It's gonna represent the hood. Like he would have superhero powers, like he just give out free Metro card swipes. That's his shit. That's it. Unlimited swipes. He's for the people, he's for the community, for the BX. Do shit like find your father. It's real cool, man. <laughs> he wouldn't even reunite you, he just punch him in the face for leaving. <laughs> Take that. Oh man. Crime is, I don't know. I don't like when people say rap. A lot of times, sometimes people say rap makes people do crime. I think that's dumb. Uh, as a former criminal, I can say rap has never made me commit a crime, although it was always good soundtrack to doing the crime. Like, it was always like, do that shit. I'm like, I'm doing it, relax. You fucking made me the focus right now. I'm just glad I'm not in jail right now, honestly, because uh, a few years ago, I was uh, awaiting sentencing. Uh, not far from here, actually. And I was nervous. I don't know if you've ever, anyone here has ever felt that when you like, go to the courtroom doors and you don't know if you're coming back out. And the reality hits when you see the, like, the, the paper on the side, the docket and all that shit. And i never forget, I saw my name and it said, the United States versus Peter D. Ray. And I was just like, how the fuck am I supposed to be Team USA by myself? This is crazy. <laughs> they got Kobe, they got LeBron. I didn't even have breakfast, man. <laughs> Public, I had a public defender. You know what that's like trying to be Team USA with a community college coach, man? It's hard. <laughs> Jay, I was talking about uh, being black and white. I'm actually mixed. I just don't know where the white is in my family. I know it's somewhere. Like, being a light skinned black guy is like being a teacup pit bull. It's like, <laughs> you're, cool, you're cool at first until they like, find out your pedigree. And it's like, send him to the pound. And it's back in the front. You seem so interesting, I know this is because you seem like a caseworker or something. Like, you here, ready to work my case or some shit. Like, are we going to get you acclimated back into the system? Hell yeah. You look like you read on the train, on the crowded train, standing up. Like, you don't even give a fuck. You don't hold on, you just. I always envy those people. It's like, I got to learn this shit. I don't like to read in public. I get paranoid. Especially on a train, I feel like people are judging how long I'm on the page. I'm just... <laughs> Start turning pages I ain't even read yet. I'm like, oh, fuck that. They're not going to think I'm dumb. They're going to think I'm the world's fastest reader. All right, um, you guys have been so much fun. I'll see you guys in a few. Thank you. All right. Right now, we're going to welcome back to the stage JL.
Coven, everybody. Let's keep it going. What do you want me to say? Uh, where do you like? Where do you like? And uh, we have a we have a special guest tonight. Um, our first guest, our first expert uh, on the panel. Uh, she's a fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and she's also an author of this book, The War on Cops. Heather McDonald, everybody. Ooh, oh, there, we go. there we go. PD's caseworker, aka my caseworker. He's a good kid. I believe in him. She's gonna pull a Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> He's gonna teach her how to break dance. It's gonna be great. Now in the One. valley of the kind of a dust. <laughs> how are you? And uh, our, uh, our next panelist, um, he was actually on our first ever unsafe space in Los Angeles. So you can say he's a repeat offender. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, he's the author of this great book, uh, A Renegade History of the United States. And he's also started an online um, university called Renegade University. Please welcome Thaddeus Russell, everybody. He's taking his time. <laughs> He's a veteran. He's got it. There we go. Here? Uh, right over there. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's not a class photo. This, uh, this is for the uh, podcast. <laughs> and then this is, yeah. We just need water. I got lots of water. I got too much water. <laughs> Everybody has two water. microphones on them right now, if, if anybody's weirded out by that. I feel like a snitch wearing this mic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, we gave you the worst wire possible. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming out, everybody. And uh, I guess we'll kick things off by just asking a, a basic question. Um, why do you think incarceration is so high in America? That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's just a setup. Well, for once, I, I would oh, actually uh, disagree if, with if you. You're talking to the, uh, in the mic. Oh, you want to start yeah, about that? Yeah. It's not the case that the United States has the same crime rates as other Western industrialized countries. We have a lot of violent crime in this country compared to our peers, our so homicide rate is seven times higher than the 21 European industrialized countries in Japan. And our gun homicide rate is 20, 20 times higher. And you, if you look at 15 to 24 year olds, it's 43 times higher. Do you think that's a product of just good old American work ethic? <laughs> <laughs> good old Remington selling all those bullets, you know, the discounting and getting them up. Do you think it's the case that, um, and I've heard this argument, uh, but maybe you're a better judge of it than I am, um, that it's similar rates of crime, but that crime in America tends to be more violent because of the amount of guns that we have? Well, so it's not similar rates of crime. Again, Japan, Tokyo has zero homicides a year. There's a city of much larger than New York City. We're very proud because we're down to 333. It used to be 2,400. Uh, so, Maybe on property crimes were similar, but it is violent crime that drives the prison population. And we experimented with de-incarceration in the 60s and early 70s, and we got rid of determinate sentencing and got a lot of community supervision. Sometimes it works, sometimes it's a great alternative, but violent crime rose 353 percent from 1960 to 1990s, and there were a lot of people victimized by that. I think the jails are probably way co more comfortable here than in Tokyo. So that has to have, because I don't know if you guys have ever been to jail. It's not that, like, it's bad because you're not free, but you get food and movies, clothing, cable, cable, yeah. lovers. showers, lovers. lovers. <laughs> it's like live action Tinder. It's just, wh whoever's bigger, it's like they're swiping your ass to the right. Do you, do you think it's also because it's a business? Like, no, I don't think it's no? a business. I, private prisons, I, you know, I think that's an over, it's an exaggerated issue. I don't think it's there. So you think much. it's the guns? Yeah, I think it's gun violence. We people, we die in America at a higher rate. Thad, you wanna? No, I'm done. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're gonna have a lot of crime and a lot of criminals if you make a lot of things illegal. Hmm. So in this country, since the 19th century, we've made a lot of things illegal like prostitution, many forms of sex work, like drugs, like alcohol for a time. So what happens when you make something illegal like that? Bad people come in to fill that market. It's called the black market, right? So we've had many, many black markets. Oh, I didn't mention gambling. Gambling has been illegal in most states for more than 100 years. Um, so that what you do when you make a black market is you force out all the people who aren't violent, 
bad guys from that market. So you gentrify that market. No, you. <laughs> I think it's the other I'll way around. I'll be here all Just, ruin, have to get, just ruining excellent points. So <laughs> I'm just going to have to give you an F. And we'll, um, no, <laughs> no. Uh, that's so the violent bad guys move in, right, and they take over that market. And so that's exactly what's happened for more than 100 years in this country. Um, and we are, as we all know, you know, in many ways, and certainly historically, especially puritanical. I mean, we have, of course, our very anti-puritanical parts of our culture as well. But we have been, we were founded by Puritans, and that part of our culture has been very strong for a long, long time. That's why we had prohibition. That's a major reason we did. And all of these other prohibitions. So we are still living under prohibition, right? Many, many prohibitions all at once, and drugs is just one of them. Um, so that is why I think we have all of these bad, violent criminals shooting at people and have for a long, long time. Now, what happened was in this country is that for various reasons, in, in large part because we're so puritanical, because we think it's so terrible to get high or sell sex, we built this massive system to put all those people away for a long, long time because we really, really hate those things. So beginning in the early 20th century, we started building prisons all over this country, more than in any other country, and filling them. And that accelerated in the, in the late 20th century by the 60s and 70s. I don't know what de-incarceration you're thinking about, but if you look at the graph, incarceration, it's, it's always going up if you look at the long history of America. But in the 60s and 70s, it spikes, and it's been spiking ever since then. And by the way, last thing I'll say. Like comedy clubs. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> last thing I'll say about this is that the people who led all of this, I mean, who led the prohibitions, who fought for all those prohibitions against sex work in the early 20th century, for pro the big prohibition against alcohol, against drugs, against gambling, who were they? They weren't Jeff Sessions. They were all of them progressive liberals. These were all progressive projects. And guess who built the prisons in all those states? Progressives. Guess who came up with a, a mandatory minimum sentences? Nelson Rockefeller, a very progressive governor. All those sentencing guidelines were all written by progressives, new dealers, for more than 100 years. That is why we have so many people in prison. There are well, so that, many that people here. There's so many people oh, here just clutching their NPR tote bags, just like <laughs> squeezing the shit out of them. Um, but what, that was Rockefeller when he was trying to flex a little bit more to the right, wasn't it? That was Rockefeller well, wanting, responding to the demands in the minority communities for getting drug dealers off the streets. The idea that drug dealing is a nonviolent crime is preposterous. People that live with open air drug markets understand they're living under the constant implicit threat of violence. This February on, on Valentine's Day, an 11 year old girl, Tequila Holmes, was shot fatally in the head by a 19 year old marijuana dealer. Now, as, as Toby mentioned, the idea that it's drug prosecutions that are driving the prison population is completely wrong. The vast majority of people in prison today are there for violent crimes or property crimes. Drug, drugs make up 16% of the state prison population, which is where 88% of all prisoners are housed. Possession is only 4% of that, and most of those have been pled down from trafficking. So are you just going to ignore everything I just said, just pass right over that, <laughs> as if I'm not here? Um, I mean, I oh, had an argument. You, we see you, Thad. Come no, on. No, no. <laughs> Some of you do. I mean, I had an argument. You don't have to agree with it, but it is an argument that's been made not just by me. Um, so let's quickly, and then I'll go back to the comedy. Um, um, Easy, John Rickles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said we. I meant we. we. Sorry. We. That can't you. be funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Heather's right about a lot of things, and by the way, everyone should read her book because she, her book, actually, I really do mean this, um, disabuses, disabused me of a lot of ideas I had about what was driving this stuff, largely racism, right? If you ask the most people who are sympathetic to Black Lives Matter, they will say the reason the prisons are full is racism. End of the discussion, and that's what we have to do. I think that's what I believe. I wanted to kill cops two years ago because of that. Um, I think that actually sends us down a very useless path. We're not gonna get anything done from that. If we, were to, if we were to eliminate all the racist cops from the police forces in this country tomorrow, we'd still be filling our prisons because we have these laws. 50% um, of violent criminals in prisons now, according to the FBI's own statistics, are members of gangs. 
Why do gangs exist in this country? Name one gang that wasn't founded around the drug trade, the prostitution trade, gambling, illegal immigration, all these prohibitions. If you eliminate those prohibitions, those gangs have no reason to exist, and we eliminate 50% of the violent crime, according to the FBI's own statistics. Okay, let me respond to that. Gangs, you're right, but being a gang member is not necessarily being involved in the drug trade. It can be, for sure. Everyone here it, has seen The Warriors, right? Not me. <laughs> oh, you haven't seen that movie? Oh, no. terrible movie. It's, oh, it's amazing. It's I terrible. love it. You didn't want to be a baseball fury? It's my favorite movie. Okay, I'll go see it, but let me just finish this. <laughs> A lot of the shootings that are going on, whether it's in Chicago, uh, South and West Sides, or in, in, in Brownsville, are over pure turf. They're over social media dissing. They have nothing to do with drug deals. These are kids that are involved in social media taunts, and they are shooting each other over perceived insults, over girlfriends. So I'm not denying that there is a, a drug gang component, but that is not it. Social media is the police greatest friend these days. Like if you don't want to be caught, for God's sakes, don't have a Facebook page throwing your gang signals. Uh, but they, it is overwhelmingly a territorial issue and, and a, a youth lack of self-control issue as opposed to drugs. As, as someone who makes a lot of videos for the internet, I don't know if I can say that I'm against actually killing trolls. I don't know. <laughs> Might be, it might be for that. Uh, Thad, I just wanted to ask you, um, if you're, if the, in response to the idea that um, all of the prohibitions have created the, um, the level of incarceration that we have in the United States, then why haven't other countries which similarly make these things illegal? Why don't they have I answered that. They don't. They haven't. Um, so they haven't. There have been similar prohibitions, and certainly in other countries, they simply haven't had the same carceral response to them as we have. For 100 years, as I said, progressives have, have, have had it up their ass to make sure that no one in this country gets high or sells sex or gambles. And they did a really good job of putting people in prison who violate those principles. And again, the people who fill that market are the bad guys. And that's why we have not just gangs, it's why we have powerful gangs. So how many people would El Chapo have killed if drugs were legal? Seven. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Probably> none. <laughs> <laughs> That's an exaggeration, but sure. Whoever, whoever, whoever fucked up his like daughter's like pinata or something like that. So you I just don't. I mean, you just don't have. I mean, it's it's an ideological thing, right? It's we in this country. We were founded by Puritans, and so we you don't see that in other countries. They simply haven't locked up people as much for those crimes. They just haven't enforced those crimes. I looking at statistics in in Asia is prostitution illegal? Yes, in most countries it's illegal. It's illegal in Thailand. Prostitution is illegal in Thailand. Uh, what does that actually meant? Not much, right? It's basically unenforced. It's basically a non-law. And that is common in countries other than the United States. I don't think, pros I don't even know that prostitution shows up in data on, on the prison population. It's a minute. Uh, and again, drug dealing is 12% is of the state prison population. And those guys are there for multiple offenses. Prison today remains a lifetime achievement award for persistence in criminal offending. You have to work very hard to get yourself sentenced to prison. Most of the time, you're put on probation. You're given multiple opportunities for community supervision. Uh, and only and the, an anti-incarceration outfit, the JFA Institute, has estimated that only 3% of all violent victimizations or property crimes end up with the offender in prison. 97% of violent crimes and, and, and property theft, people being mugged, people are still out on the streets. So again, we have a lot of crime in this country, uh, and that's what's driving the prison population. And I think that we could take drugs out of the, of the equation and you would still have a lot of gun violence and a lot of theft. So we actually have a, a, a question from the audience. I believe this man, uh, his high school superlative was most likely to, to actually go to prison. So <laughs> with that, you can just hang right here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold this for you. Sure, sure. Um, so you referenced a case that happened where Tequila, it's Tequila Holmes, or somebody was shot 
by a 19-year-old marijuana dealer. But like he said, if marijuana was not illegal, would that situation even have happened? Right. Well. Great question. I'm glad you were listening to me. <laughs> it was also the only case ever where marijuana was more deadly than tequila. <laughs> <laughs> It's Takia, but that, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, was that just a, was that a question, or just you just wanted to agree with me? Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Is it a question? Oh, well, another one. I, I just wanted to point something out. Uh, Al Capone uh, murdered people by you know while he was selling alcohol because it was illegal, mm -hmm. but he got put in prison for income tax evasion. <laughs> so, but. Why was he evading income taxes? And it wasn't necessarily because he was murdering people, but because behind all of it was the alcohol prohibition. And in Britain, where they never had alcohol prohibition, uh, there were no Al Capones in the 20s and 30s. So I think, in a way, we can reconcile the points that both of you make. Because once you've got these prohibitions, that creates a black market, and the black market means violence. So the people in the black market, whether they're getting busted for drugs or not, uh, they're getting, you know, you want to bust them, first of all, for the violence that is generated by the black market. So I think he, both of you are right in a way. How is she right from that? I don't get that part. <laughs> So, so far, it sounds like it's 2-0 and o for me. They're in prison not for selling drugs, but for the violence. And say, well, Al Capone was in prison not for selling alcohol, but for income tax evasion. So was the problem income tax? Well, I think so. <laughs> but <laughs> Tax is theft next, next week. <laughs> the ponytail, I think, said it. I feel like that was Al Capone's accountant. <laughs> um, I want to ask, because you're, you're, you're laying the, um, you know, basically the criminalization of various things at the feet of progressives, but what about people like Reagan and the war on drugs, who it's often attributed to? Yeah, conservatives are not uh, scot-free of this. You know, they, they certainly took, uh, took part in it. But if you um, were to read any of the recent very good, well, some of them are very good histories of um, the war on drugs and the war on crime, they, they all locate the origins of the modern wars on crime and drugs in the 1960s and early 1970s in the Kennedy, Johnson, and the Nixon administrations. And then Reagan is sort of just an acceleration of what started then. And what those books all argue, and I think they're right, is that Nixon and Reagan simply took the model begun by the progressives in the early 20th century and uh, accelerated by Kennedy and Johnson and just built on it. So for instance, the nationalization of poli the police in this country, right? That idea, which has led to the incarceration of a lot of people, and it's led to the militarization of the police, which we've heard a lot about. Who came up with that idea? It was Theodore Roosevelt and his progressive Department of Justice in 1906, 1908, who established the FBI. That, the FBI is a progressive institution. It was established by a progressive administration. Um, in the 1960s, Johnson is the one who put forward a bill that was passed by Congress to funnel hundreds of millions of dollars in weaponry and money to local police forces and to oversee the policing in local police forces. He, they were the first to nationalize policing. Nixon and Reagan just accelerated all that. So, I mean, that's one, that's a very, I can answer this in, much, in a longer way, but uh, that conservatives certainly have taken part in it, but it is a fundamentally, originally a progressive project. It felt like the yada, yada, yada from Seinfeld, like, and then Nixon, yada, 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 Reagan, yada, yada, yada. It's progressives. <laughs> but I would Again, also add someone's to not listening, but OK. I thought. No, I'm listening. I mean, I don't know why you're being incredibly smug. I made, I made a joke. OK. <laughs> I get it. You're citing, you're citing, fan, like, you're citing statements with great authority that I'm certain many people in this room, not just because they have a progressive thumb up their ass, don't necessarily completely subscribe to. But yes, 10 out of 10 on smug. <laughs> Gee, OK. OK. I, I would say, I, I was expecting Thaddeus that, to say. Um, you know, I, I do expect that from a prosecutor. 
You two, I'm gonna turn the hose on. <laughs> You guys are like the Bloods and the Crips right now. You're yeah, just no so drugs, fucking, no He's no like, drugs. too old! Right? Ah! <laughs> Which was started by Abraham Lincoln, a progressive. <laughs> but just get rid of the marijuana. It'll all, it'll all, it'll all go better. But um, uh, the other origin is not Johnson. It's not the progressives. It's not, it's not Nixon and it's not Reagan. The real origin for the desire to do something about drugs, again, was people in the communities that were afflicted by open-air drug markets. Now, I'm just gonna put on True. hold True. Thaddeus's sort of original argument, which is that, well, the root of all of this is prohibition. Let's just put that aside for the moment and assume prohibition uh, and look at the reality. What I want to address is the argument that has been popularized by Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, which argues that drug enforcement is a racist plot to re-enslave blacks. That is completely historically ignorant. The Rockefeller drug laws, you talk about Rockefeller being a progressive, he was responding to community activism in places like Harlem and the South Bronx of people saying, we are living under tyranny. We cannot go to the market. Elderly people cannot pick up their social security checks without fear of having to run through the gauntlet of people controlling the streets. The same with the, the allegedly racist federal crack penalties. Why was the penalties for crack elevated, it began with the Congressional Black Caucus. Charles Rangel in the Senate said we need higher federal penalties. But the book doesn't deny that stuff. Yeah, Which it, does, book? it does actually. Michelle Alexander, she... Yes, she I mean, totally I ignores book. it. I haven't met Michelle yeah. Alexander, she but I know that she mentions the book it. She says it's all about Nixon and the Southern strategy. That is simply wrong. It was the Johnson administration that pointed out the rise in violent crime and said it's the elderly who can't get on buses. Bus drivers are circumventing minority neighborhoods because the violence was so bad. And that continues today. You can't go, I, I spend a lot of time in police community meetings in the 41st Precinct, in the South Bronx, in the 23rd in East Harlem, in the 33rd in, in, in Central Harlem. Every single time you hear some variant of this question, you arrest the dealers and they're back on the corner the next day. Why can't you keep them off the streets? This is something, the police are not doing this for fun. They enforce the laws because that's what they're being begged to do by the law, the millions of law-abiding residents right. in high crime I'm areas. Sorry. PD, sorry. Um, I agree. Um, what was your experience like? Uh, wh where were you growing up uh, as a kid? I was in the Bronx, mm -hmm. uh, White Plains Road. I don't know. I like. I, I. I don't know. Like you guys are fucking. You read books. A lot of them. <laughs> you seem very stressed out because you're very. You have so much knowledge. You just like. It's just like you just. I gotta make this point. <laughs> I just. It's not honest. And it's not that I don't give a shit. It's cool. Everybody's fucking whatever. But me personally, I just felt like it. Me. It was my environment. It was, you know, wanting more from life and just wanting more and not having any fucking hope and just looking at everybody else around where it's like, if there's not a brighter day on the other side, it's like, why not? You know, it's like, uh, I would call it indirectly committed suicide because I was never scared of whatever happened. But now I got, you know, goals and shit. So it's like a little different. <laughs> so in your neighborhood, uh, what was the easiest way to make a lot of money? Uh, like I said, I tried selling drugs at first. Like I tried to, we got a few friends together. We put down to get some drugs and we all used the drugs. <laughs> so then the easiest way was just robbing people because the gun did all the work. It just fucking, you know, like give me your shit, you get your shit, you know? And it's not like, uh, thinking in hindsight, it's like, what the fuck am I gonna buy a mansion off of stealing people's chains and jackets? But at the time, it just felt like, man, I got something to eat tonight. I got something so, to fucking, you know, so, so nourish me. The, so should we legalize theft? Well, hold on. Uh, <laughs> if it's all a product of prohibition, I mean, it, we'd also solve the prison population by legalizing so homicide. So therefore, we shouldn't legalize drugs? I don't quite get that argument. But um, so. Well, um, no, it just means that it's not necessarily drug prohibition that no, is driving prison population. No, we have to make a decision as a country. And so, Heather, so I completely agree with her on 
this, uh, she says, she calls it a myth, uh, this myth of the racist conspiracy to incarcerate black people. Um, it's not, it's not what it is. It's never was, there's no evidence for that. There really isn't, at least not since 1950. Um, so if the black market, I guess I didn't explain this, but you know, what do black markets do to prices, right? They drive the prices way, way, way up because it restricts the supply dramatically, right? Um, so that's why you can get rich in the South Bronx with no education being a 16 year old kid selling drugs. If you eliminate that, the, the prices will drop dramatically if you make the drugs legal. And you can't, I, in a way, I almost don't want to make that happen because I love it when people are Then the kids are like, yo, I got to go to school rich. so I can yeah. sell this crack. Man. But you would not be able to get rich if those <laughs> drugs were legal, selling drugs. No, it's like, yo, I'm going to go work for Cracksir. The main crack distributor in the world, and <laughs> fuck, the, the, this, the startup company. Yeah, it's like uh, the Pfizer of crack. Uh, uh, Dan, crack so. Dan, Dan, Mit, uh, Dan Mitchell, um, um, I think I think he writes for for Cato uh, sometimes. An economist. Uh, he was actually talking about um, the decriminalized uh, marijuana uh, industry in Colorado, and he was saying that uh, even there, where it's decriminalized, there is this huge black market. One of the reasons being that it's so heavily regulated that it's actually more expensive to do it to go the legit route than it is to just right. you know, sell them. Like for instance, I think this is right, I could be wrong about this, but I've heard at least that in Colorado, I think it's, you're barred from entering the business now if you have a felony. So what that means is it's all like rich white corporate CEOs who are in the pot business in Colorado. It's heavily Excellent regulated. Excellent for yeah. me. I got a, I got a friend, uh, another comic, he comes from a good background, and his family actually opened the first, uh, one of the first dispensaries in in Massachusetts, in Brockton, Massachusetts. And it was so funny because he was telling me about it. He's like, yo, this is so cool. And I'm like, man, you guys must get high all this. He's like, yeah, no one in my family fucking smokes weed at all. And he was just telling me how much money they made. Like the first weekend open, they basically sold out. And I was just like, wow. That's so I knew a guy who uh, whose family owned a Carvel. They didn't eat ice cream. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no diabetes. Exactly. So I, I, just, I, did, I wanted to reiterate, though, again, my agreement with Heather, she's completely right about the other part uh, that I think was missed, maybe, in that there was a, a very large movement among African Americans in places like Harlem and South Chicago to crack down hard on dealers and the drug trade generally. The Nelson Rockefeller laws the people, the main drivers, or some of the main drivers behind that were black community activists and politicians and ministers in those neighborhoods. So it's very true. And that's sort of one very large piece of evidence that it wasn't this racist conspiracy. It, it, to me, it's an empirical question about drug legalization. It's nothing, I actually have skirted that question in my work. And it's it's an empirical question. Are we, are we better off with uh, more people getting stoned, because I think you have to agree, that is pretty much just, okay, happy we, we days coming. We got consensus coming. Okay, in, the, good. Uh, in the crowd. Fine. <laughs> she's already stoned, so she's, yeah. Yeah, so Form, maybe, you know, mind, it, it, if, if we end up with, you know, less driving accidents, better workplace performance, people learning more because drugs are legal, and less violence, that's fine. I'd, I'd love to do a controlled experiment and because it, I, it, it's really it's a question done. of what works. It's been well, done. It's called Portugal. So Portugal decriminalized drugs, I think it's now 15 years ago. It's more than a decade now. Got a lot of Portuguese We have extensive over here. studies that have been done, multiple studies. So crime has gone down. Deaths because of drugs have gone down. HIV rates have gone down. All of it, all the bad stuff has gone down. Addiction has gone down in Portugal. And if you don't believe me, you can ask Glenn Greenwald, you can ask the Cato Institute, they've done massive studies on this, and I think there's others as well, multiple studies to show this. So it's been done, I, we, have, I, we have an experiment. I feel like overall there, there's sort of, um, uh, it seems like in the United States there's um, you know, this idea that um, you have laws on the books and then the citizenry complains that those laws are being enforced. And it seems like that happens with a lot of different, yeah. with a lot of different things as opposed to, this is where she, Heather's also completely right, yeah. and this is what people miss all the time. All of these laws weren't imposed by these, you know, racist white crackers, you know, trying to like and just do bad things to us. These were all democratically enacted laws. These were, these were laws that people wanted. She's totally right about that. <clears throat> and it wasn't just white people who wanted them. In fact, I would say, I bet you, that there was probably a larger um, uh, support for 
these very harsh drug sentencing laws among African Americans in the 1970s and among whites. I would be surprised if that's true. Nice. Michael Javen Fortner, who's a, a sociologist, I forget, he's a CUNY or somewhere, somewhere, he's written the definitive book on this, but it's, it's clear that that was happening. Uh, it, these are all, these, we did this. We did this. Amer the American people did this. We, we passed laws. We, we voted for politicians who said they would do this, and we got what we asked for. So um, we'll go to you in one second. I just wanted to ask. Um, so the response to this that I've heard uh, in the press and stuff like that is that you know, at the time of the crack epidemic, for example, there were uh, black communities that were asking for harsher penalties, but they were also asking that at the same time they were asking for more funding, better schooling, and all these other things which could have you know, also eliminated the root of the problem. And they didn't get that. They just got more policing and they got more incarceration. Um, and I'm curious, this is what I've read, um, and uh, I'm curious also for Petey, uh, what was the relationship like uh, growing up between you know, people who were doing crime in the community and the police? You try to stay away from them. <laughs> There's no relation between the people doing crime. It's like, even for me, when people say, fuck the police, I'm like, I'm on probation. I can't. Like, when you're a criminal, you don't really have the same perspective, per se. You kind of try to want to fit in with everybody. Like, yeah, shit ain't right. <laughs> it ain't right. But in the back of your mind, you're like, I'm a fucking scumbag doing dirt. And, you know, like, for me personally, it's just like, I always kind of saw it. Like, if I, I never got convicted of doing something that I didn't do. And I never sat in the cell. If anything, I always sat in the cell and thought, why the fuck did I do this shit? You start asking yourself shit therapists probably should have asked you when you were younger. But that's, like, that's why I call it cell therapy, because he's like, why the fuck? But yeah, I don't know. I just. J JL, what was um, your experience as a, as a prosecutor? Like? Pretty chill. Pretty chill? <laughs> <laughs> sat in my office, search, sur surfed the net, went to court, threw some guys with a Z at the end of their name, and in jail. <laughs> did, did, did you did you feel um, as though like the people like kind of like passing through your way that um, they had actually you know committed the crimes or they were being railroaded? Or it, well, it, it like did feel you? very. It felt very automated, the system. And I mean, a lot of people talk about how many. I mean, if 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 every defendant simply decided not to plea bargain, the system would come to a crashing halt. Like if they simply exercised their right to a trial, couldn't couldn't function. Like. So it felt at times very, you know, you'd, I, I remember wondering like my first, my first month, I was like, I have 30 cases. I, I just got here out of, out of law school. But of course, 30 cases doesn't mean 30 trials. It doesn't mean 30. It means you're handling 30 matters, 28 of which will be pled, pled out because the defense lawyers have the same sort of interest in moving the process along. Because if I have 30 cases, they probably have 80. So it's like, let's just get the best possible thing we can do that I can go home and sleep at night and not feel like I, but it, it was, it, it felt very much like a factory. And I, I, only, I was only there four years, so it's not like I, you know, I second sat a murder trial, but I wasn't handling, the, the, the toughest shit I handled was, you know, a couple of gun cases. Um, but it felt very much like a, like a factory, um, which obviously when you're dealing with human lives uh, is not, not the greatest. Did you feeling. wear suspenders? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Was it your experience that a lot of the cases were due to like personal grudges, or were they based on drugs, or what, what was the origin of most of the stuff you worked? Well, they break us into different departments, and the Nar narcotics bureau is like the busiest bureau of, of the whole. You know, that was they had the most cases. Um, my my bureau was the rackets bureau, which the first stuff, uh, as, as my esteemed colleague to my right will enjoy, prostitution was one of because it was like. The bureau was like a holdover from when organized crime was, was thriving in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And so we had things like prostitution, gambling, guns. Mm -hmm. And then as you moved up, it was, those were the kind of cases where they would basically hope to link to bigger fish. So like, hey, if you get prostitutes, if you get uh, gambling rings, or if you get guns, that's the kind of stuff you hope to lead to bigger, to bigger fish. Um, it, a lot of the time it felt like this guy doesn't know shit. Like we're, we're it's a fishing expedition like, hey, let's give this guy a criminal record uh, if he doesn't plea out. Uh, and half the time, he'd be like, I'd be telling my boss, like, I don't think this guy has any information. I think he's just a random dude who's <laughs> doing some bodega gambling. Uh, yeah. I, <laughs> or selling loose cigarettes. Right. Well, yeah. Well, but <laughs> one of the recently, when I've been to police community meetings, one of the things that the commanders warn 
the good people that have shown up to those meetings to learn about crime in their community and to beg the police to do something about the teens hanging out on corners fighting uh, and, the, and the dealers is elder abuse to the meaning fraud of scams where people call and, and claim that, you know, call this number and you're either there's been somebody taken hostage or trying to get credit card information. So there's a lot of crime. Again, I'm, it's an empirical question with Thaddeus, how much would disappear if we legalized everything under the sun? But there, let's just not assume that that's entirely the panacea for everything. There's a lot of people. Didn't work in the purge. <laughs> Didn't work what? All right. In the purge? It's, it's another fantastic movie you've missed. Oh, darn! I, I, next time, give me a give me a viewing list or something. I, I, that would be amazing if before the show, we, we just sent every shitty movie. We just gave you a list of like 10 of them. You know, like, I did the research. Um, we, have a, we have a question from the uh, audience. <clears throat> Hello. This has hey. been so funny and political and more than I could have imagined. So thank you guys for being awesome. Just my first comment. My second comment is that you are wondering, well, if we're going to legalize prostitution, if we're going to legalize marijuana, some people say, well, then why not legalize everything? Why not legalize murder? Why not legalize theft? And the answer is, if you're interested in legal theft, you could go to DC and work for the IRS and even get a pension for that. So uh, that's that's Grover Norquist, everybody. <laughs> Grover Norquist. There so that, that's the first place. Or Albany. Albany's a great town, um, full of great people. Even City Hall, a few blocks away, will do you a great job. Um, but uh, beyond that, my second comment was that you said that this country was founded by Puritans. Um, and I would say that maybe to some extent they were Puritans, but their puritanical nature pales far in comparison to anything that they could have imagined that we would become today. They actually had ideas like the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence, and they did not outlaw cocaine or marijuana or heroin or any substance like that. And there was actually, there used to be this idea called habeas corpus where you actually owned your own body. It was, it was a cool idea. And then we gave up on it. And my last question. Lincoln suspended it. I told you, the progressives. <laughs> and then uh, my, my last question is, so you say. Uh, I just said there hasn't been one question yet. <laughs> uh, not one. Not, You're right. Not You're, one right. Question. You're right. You're right. I'm a Puritan. <laughs> my, fear, my, my first question is, you say that there are these countries like Thailand that don't enforce laws. And, and I would say that there is an interesting distinction when you study law between enforce, interpret, legislate, but why, um, but if they really don't enforce them, then why not just legalize them? And if, why is there a, a, such a gap between the legislative, the judicial, and the executive branches of government? <laughs> That's for you. That, for was, sure. my, that was mine? Uh, the only thing I know about Thailand is uh, is The Hangover 2, which was a terrible movie. Heather, you got to see that one. <laughs> Don't see the first one. I got to write see these the down. Start with the okay, sequel. Hangover 2. <laughs> I mean, the idea that there was more to do with that. constitutional protections at the founding is kind of amazing. Uh, the whole exclusionary rule would have astounded the founders that you had to throw out an entire criminal case if there was a charge that the a police officer had violated an evidentiary rule, uh, which are enormously complicated. How, I mean, I went to law school, you did too, and the, the rules for search and seizure of what you can take from a trunk and what's invisible and what's not is just mind boggling. But the solution is to possibly bring a suit against the police officer, not to throw out a clearly uh, let a clearly guilty defendant run free. And of course, the founders had no problem with capital punishment. Now, one can argue for or against. I'm, I, you know, I, I think it's way pun. too slow. <laughs> it, it has no deterrent effect. It's, it's too it's slow. Course. We got to speed that up. <laughs> <laughs> you heard no, it. Heather McDonald no, said. No, I, right. No. It's so slow. Let's just get rid of it. It doesn't, it has no effect. What's punishment has no effect unless it's swift and certain within the rights of due like process. Like in the Philippines? 
what they're doing. Yeah. I like caning. Oh, I like do caning. Tear <laughs> caning for graffiti. I think it's a great idea. What so. was that? Wait, what was a good? What's a good idea? Caning. That's a, caning that's is a good in idea. Singapore. Yeah, All absolutely. Right. But I think the exclusion. That's just so honest. Now I'm definitely done. But the exclusionary rule, I think, has to do more with preserving the overall system and like ideals behind, like our country. Not like it, it's you're punishing the police because people have to have sort of faith in the legal system. And if you just if guys can plant evidence or search, there, like there has to be. I think because it's not just in that one case. It's setting the example of like if we allow cops this leeway to fuck around too much, nobody will ever have faith that the system is legitimate. So the penalty is harsh because it's not just about that one case. It's about sort of the overall system and integrity of it. But what if the system isn't legitimate, hmm. right? I mean, I think it might be healthy to have your attitude about cops, actually, and the law more particularly. I think a lot of, like, the root, like I said, I don't read as many books as you guys, but I just feel like it's it's... You could the pro prohibition, fucking all that shit, the uh, the shit that's illegal. I feel like when there's certain people, there's always gonna there's gonna be someone that wants more. Yeah. Always, there's always gonna be. Even if weed was legal, there's a guy that has more weed than the other guy, and then that's where the conflict begins. So go to the lowest form, go to the hood, and it's like we want a little some. So it's like you're willing to do the extremes just for a little thing. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, um, I'm, and that was basically just my question. Actually, what you're saying. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, just about this randomized controlled experiment that we we're talking about in Portugal. Um, so, I, I mean, personally, I'll just say this. You know, my bias is against is for decriminalization, like especially of something like marijuana, which I think is, you know, in general, at least as safe, if not safer, than alcohol and et cetera. Um, but you know, it, it, what are the gun laws like in Portugal? You know, so like what, like how, how would that actually affect our society here? Um, so I guess that, that, that's my question. So we created a black market and which means that only bad people, violent people can enter it, right? And then we have gun laws that make it nearly impossible for the good people to have guns. So we basically establish a monopoly for the bad people in both those markets and in guns. That seems like a great mix. JL, your eyebrows are speaking. It was into, <laughs> into the mic. I, I, how is it, I don't, impossible for good guys to get guns? In New York City, how, tell me how, how easy would it be for me to have a gun in New York City? <laughs> well, assuming I'm a good guy. Mm -hmm. But New York's not the only city. Right, you know? San Francisco, you name it, San, Baltimore, you name it. Tell me how easy it would be for a good guy like me or you to have a gun. I mean, I live in L.A. It's nearly I, impossible. I own a gun. When I lived, I used to live in Orlando. They're good guys in other states and cities, right? But I was uh, about like 18. Real. I lived in Orlando for, for a time. And I remember buying a shotgun with just an ID. That was all I needed. It's like, they're like, hold you. But like where, the, where most of the crime happens, which is the major cities, yeah, too. it's nearly impossible to own a gun legally. That hasn't been my experience. In Where? Los Angeles? Los Angeles? Yeah. Well, you can, okay, you can't carry it around, though. You have to have it in your house under lock and key. You can't I know, have it, it on sucks. you. <laughs> That's my point. That's my point. You can't have but, the gun with you. Yeah, Toby, not, not, to, not the, to give anybody looking to fuck you up any ideas, but you only have a long gun. You don't have a, you don't have a handgun. A handgun's yeah, a but I could get a handgun. You could? Yeah. Do it. <laughs> I, think, I think it would look really sexy. <laughs> I don't know. The, the, um, this summer, there were five cops assassinated in Dallas by a killer who was inspired by the Black Lives Matter narrative that the cops were racist and were living through an he epidemic psychosis, of racial. He, he, his 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 goal was to kill white people and white cops in particular. And when the shooting first happened, it was released that there were 20 people involved in this cold-blooded assassination. And they subsequently realized it was just one gunman. But the reason the cops originally thought that there were that many people is because Texas has an open carry law. And there were so many people walking around with guns on display that the cops didn't know who the good guys were and the bad guys were. I've, I'm sympathetic to police chiefs who basically say they're pro-gun control 
you would say they just want a monop the state wants a monopoly on power. But to me, it's not a sign of civilization to have people walking around openly carrying guns armed to the teeth. I, you know, there's research, John Lott argues more guns, less crime, that places with, uh, you know, the most permissive gun laws have the least crime. I think there's a lot of other things that could explain that. But, but to me, uh, it's putting a lot of burden on the police in places that have very liberal laws to have to distinguish in a situation like that who's the bad guy and who's the good guy. Heather, is there, is there a breakdown as far as um, uh, people in prison because of um, illegally holding like guns or, because I know there, there's um, like, um, what's his name, uh, Burris who used to play for the Giants. Plaxico. Uh, Plaxico, yeah. yeah, he was. A lot of people. Uh, he had a um, he, he had a license in one state, and then made the mistake so of stop going. and frisk in this city. Was it was? Oh no, it was a, a nightclub. No, 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 he, no, he, I think he shot himself. Stop and frisk. The policy, I believe, right? Was we could probably talk about. about was originally that. an anti-gun policy. Yes and no. I mean, it's it's not just guns. It's also just if somebody if there's been a string of robberies in a neighborhood of elderly women getting stuck up, and the police people see, don't even do that no more. They rob young people. <laughs> Yeah. That's like what, the, in the, what you talk about in the 80s in the Bronx. That's nobody <laughs> robbing old people no more. You helping the old lady. You robbing her son. <laughs> okay, so there's been a, a string of robberies of young teens. All right, let's just change the hypo. And you see some guy walking behind a young teen coming out of, out of uh, high school. You question him. Or if there's, been, if there's been car thefts on a street and you see some guy walking along pulling the door handles, the cop is going to make a stop and question that person. So, or if you yes, just see them walking down the subway stairs with a bunch <laughs> of other people, you just stop them and yeah, say, "Let me right, look at your bag." Right. Yeah, yeah. Because that was—I mean, if you look, the, the stop and fricks numbers obviously have plummeted by like you know, not, I don't know how much percent, but like by a factor of whatever. But the crime has continued to stay low. Like, so you've cut down from you know half a million stops to like ninety thousand stops, and yet crime has remained at basically the same rate. So the stop and frisk thing really wasn't effective. It wasn't, I mean, it was maybe making people feel like, hey, look, the cops are you know, harassing black and brown teens. I feel better. Uh, but it wasn't actually doing anything statistically significant. Cops were just telling them to pull their pants up. That's what they were doing. Well, yeah. Uh, They're not actually, all going to be winners. <laughs> I know that. The NYPD is really big. I mean, what they've, they've substituted command presence. They've got a lot of cops now on the corners that are deterring by their presence. There were definitely bad stops. There's no question about it. But basically, the cops were targeting known gang members. I've talked to a lot of kids that say they've never been stopped by a cop. It's, you know, this is, we, we believe that this doesn't occur, that every black kid in New York has been stopped by a cop. It's just not true. No, but uh, it's not about has everybody been stopped. It's about the people that had the half a million stops that do occur. Yeah. When 90% of those yield nothing, I can't imagine there are 500,000 teenage gang members in New York City or gang members between the ages of like 19 and 27. I can't imagine there's, I mean, they could just run, they could fucking take over the state house if they were that large a constituency. They're like, ah, we'll just do it the legal way. We're the largest voting block in New York State. Yet another plug for the Warriors. <laughs> I think, the, for me, the first time I ever got uh, pulled over by a cop, I was like 14, maybe? And I was going home. I was just walking home. I, was, uh, I got my first job, summer youth, 14 years old. And I got pulled over, and then they, they didn't throw me, but like, it was just, it felt weird being on a hot hood. You know, and then just like a cop going through your bag and shit. And it was before, I, like, I don't know if the term stop and frisk was, it was just what they did. So, and then you just get used to it. And like, even for me, when they were like, stop and frisk, I'm like, that's what they do. I don't know. They gave it a term now, but it's just what happens in the, like, especially in the hood. You see a cop and they see you, you look a little funny, your butt cheeks get tight, and they're like, this guy's a fucking suspect. <laughs> you know? And the sad part is a lot of the, the sad part too is like, I see a lot of the, like you see the guys, the worst is like you see the fucking suspects. You're like, why he gotta look like me? This ain't right. So it's like, I mean, what are you gonna do? Move, move somewhere nicer. We'll also say that I think the line that they used at some point was that they said they'd like to stop and frisk everybody. They just don't have the resources to do it. And I think that you know, I don't feel like. I mean, I do feel like the Fourth Amendment, you know, protection against unreasonable search and seizure should stop someone from just stopping me when I'm going about my business. And I think that, you know, when we do have relatively low crime rates, you know, uh, 
I mean, in terms of like whether you're, if you have to carry a gun or subject yourself to this, I mean, I, I do think it's just like a civil society shouldn't have to have to worry about these questions. Yeah, and, and being stopped is incredibly infuriating, humiliating, and can be terrifying. There's no question. And cops should explain why they make the stop. And of course, they should meet the reasonable <laughs> suspicion standard for making the stop. they like, because you live here. Well, what the fuck do you okay, mean? That's no, an abuse. No, 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 no. I never, like, even at the, I didn't feel like, man, why did they stop me? I was like, oh, I live here. I get it. You well, look out you the window, also... you see it happening, and then you're like, well, it's going to happen to me eventually. But was that before you were robbing people? What, yeah, it was before. It was like when, I mean, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, gradu he, I graduated. He said I might as well start <laughs> robbing if I'm going to already no, be stopped. I, no, for real. Like, I graduated into, like, in my crime, even, like, when I'm on probation for now. I swear to God, I'm, like, on probation for a white-collar crime. Like, I, I fucking, it was, uh, it was... Mail, uh, mail fraud and, like, money laundering and shit like that. So, but I graduated up into, like, I started from stealing from stores. And I started, somebody stole from me as a kid. And I was like, all right, my friend, like, a friend stole from me. So that was, like, the moment of, like, well, fuck everybody. Now I'm going to steal from people, not people that I know, but anybody. It was, like, an open market. We got the future me. Bernie Madoff right on the stage <laughs> yeah. right now. He's going to just feel like even crime in New York is gentrifying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a, another uh, question from the audience. Um, well, I didn't come up here to talk about guns, but I do want to say that I also live in L.A., and I do think it's very hard to own a gun in L.A., a handgun in particular, if you want to use it for self-protection. Um, if you want to use it as, like, a display piece, then, you know, you can have it separate from your bullets or whatever, but to actually carry it around, you have to ask What permission. a weird display piece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'd be surprised. I go on Reddit. Um, no, it's, <laughs> it's definitely very difficult to own a gun there um, if you want to use it for self-protection. Um, but that's not what I was uh, going to ask. My question... Um, was actually, um, you brought up the idea of like potentially suing a cop if they do something, uh, if they do something wrong or, or kind of outside the norm, except for that's ridiculously hard to do um, because of qualified immunity. And so I've often wondered what we can, like what would happen if we did allow that, if we um, lifted the crappy policy of qualified immunity and and just kind of like let them fight it out in the courts. And if you're going to do crappy things, then you're going to get got. You know, you get better policing, more accountable cops. Right, exactly. Uh, what, like, what one of the first things I think we need to do is bust all of the cop unions, like abolish them completely and rip up those contracts. They have virtual immunity. They can kill people and get away with it. And it happens all the time. Now, I also agree with Heather that in most of those cases, they're not necessarily bad shootings. The problem is they're following protocol. They're following the law in most of those cases that look terrible to us, right? When I saw those videos, I was sure that's, that shit is racist and that cop is evil and he should fry. And then you find out when you start reading that he was actually following the law that was enacted by a democratic legislature in his state in almost every case. He was following the letter of the law, right? And often, as we know, they're black cops doing this, right? In fact, I think it's more likely, I think you've actually written this, right? It's more, I think black cops, the statistically, black cops are more likely to shoot and kill a black suspect. Well, they're more likely- they're better at sports. They're... <laughs> <laughs> well, they're also a Justice Department study under the Obama administration that came out in March 2015 found that black and Hispanic cops in Philadelphia were more likely to shoot black suspects because of threat misperception, which is mistaking somebody's cell phone for a gun than white cops. So that's... Uh... Yeah. Well, we want to impress your new friends. <laughs> I mean, a threat is real. Uh, I think we... <laughs> <laughs> I feel... No, you know what's crazy? Like, after I fucking straightened up my act, and, like, I don't... I've been fortunate to kind of be able to look at my life and try to make some kind of sense of it and try to define what it is, what, what it's about. It's, it's like, it's just hard. Cause even like going back to my hood, like going back to the hood and knowing like, man, there's only, mostly people that look like me here. You know what I mean? And even growing up, I didn't grow up around white people. I, like the white people I knew were the doctor, that back, back before Indians and Asians got a hold of the game, it was like <laughs> white people were doctors. White people were your shrinks. White people were the teachers. White people. So it was always like, it was never like a black and white thing. It was just always like, this is my community. Uh, you know, if I get robbed, it's a lot of times it's, I'm in my hood and it's somebody that looks like me. 
You know what I mean? I remember the first time, actually the first time I got, that's what led me to get a gun the first time. It wasn't even to rob people. I got robbed. I was on the bus going home, and I didn't know about karma yet, because I had burglarized the house. Like, <laughs> me and my cousin burglarized the house, and we stole some shit. And in hindsight, I'm like, I'm karma. But as it happened, I'm like, man, it's fucked up. They stole my gold chain, and I stole the money in a burglary. And then, Did you learn about karma from your white yoga instructor? <laughs> nah, that was, that was just, you know, you get older, you have white friends. And then... <laughs> But no, like, and so, yeah, it was, it's hard, especially now. Like, it's like I look around, and I'm like, the thing, I think the biggest thing that could have helped me as a kid growing up was somebody or something, like, my dad wasn't around. I was just kind of running around. And if I would have just, I, I feel like, I don't know if this is a fact, but this is me in hindsight thinking, like, trying to, being around successful people. When you get older, you're like, man, this guy kind of had his life together. His parents kind of molded him a certain way. And I feel like if I would have had someone to tell me, like, yo, no matter what the shit looks like, you can get out of here. Doesn't fuck, it's just up to you if you want to really get out. I felt like that, that shit, dreams was taboo. Nobody fucking dreams and makes it. Even the people you see go away to school for fucking eight years, they come back. They work at UPS, they, they become a teacher. So it's like they went away. And at the time, no, at the time, especially in the hood, in the hood, people are like, wow. They're like, wow, my, your sister's going to college. And then you're on the, I'm on the street. I'm doing illegal things. I'm making way more money than her, and I'm helping her go to college at, like, 17. So it's like it just didn't make sense. And, it, like, I feel like if I knew what, I've known to, what I know today as a kid, I'm like, dude, I would have been fucking probably, uh, I'd have been you right now. <laughs> Look, we got the same color socks on. Did you see that? <laughs> I might have been you, but that's just, you know. So, like, even for me, one of my goals is to be able to help other kids, like, from where I'm from or anybody. Just like, that. you, you can like fucking do this shit. Big Brother program? Like that? No, actually, I got to get back to, I used to volunteer at the door over on, uh, I think it's Broom Street. And it's like an alternative, uh, it's like an alternative space for teens. And I just try, you know, talk to them, well, ask you questions and shit. Oh, you're a comic, so, you know, stuff like that, where it's like, yo, you can do something else. You know, I didn't think, it, I, I couldn't fathom that shit as a kid. Like, no, there's no way out. Yeah, I do, I, I do wonder, um, you know, how much of it is um, the idea of, of, you know, looking to punish crime versus deterring crime and, and starting when kids are, are younger. Well, that's uh, why I think the, 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 the judicial system and the system is just like society. It's a reflection. Donald Trump is a reflection of the fucking world we live in today. People, you never hear someone in court say, why'd you do that? They want to know who the fuck did it, what did they do, and then we're going to judge you. If you wanted to fix the problem, you would try to find the solution of why it happened, and you'd fix it, but that's not the case. Whoa, applause break. I mean, you know your boys out here. I don't read many books. I just think about shit a lot. <laughs> I think we have uh, one more. Yeah. Um. Thanks for all of this, but I, ha I have to say, I feel like you're not, we're not having an honest discussion if you actually just dismiss the whole race issue. Yes, it can be what you said and also race. Is there any institution in this country that's not, does not have a racial bias of some sort? I mean, look at education, healthcare, look at all of our outcomes, and then to just say, no, ju the judicial system and incarceration doesn't have anything to do with race, just seems like then we're not having an honest conversation then. It can be all of those things. It's extremely nuanced. And to dismiss that one very important part of it, I think is then just meaning that this conversation is not really honest. Well, there's been the trying cowards to Cowards clap harder. <laughs> Fucking cowards. Trying to show that racial disparities in the prison population are due to racism in the criminal justice system has been the goal of criminologists for decades. And they've been forced against their better desires to conclude that it is due to racial disparities in criminal offending. And those are very uncomfortable to talk about. So let's talk about victimization rates instead. Blacks die of homicide at six times the rate of whites and Hispanics in this country. That's a problem. 
In 2015, when we had a very, the largest homicide increase in nearly 50 years in this country, because cops are backing off of proactive policing, another 900 black males were killed compared to 2014, bringing the black homicide total to over 7,000 compared to 5,000 whites and Hispanics combined. Blacks are 13% of the population and black males are 6% of the population. They make up the vast, vast majority of homicide victims. And, and who's killing those blacks? It's not the cops and it's not whites, it's other blacks. Blacks commit homicide. Again, these are very uncomfortable things to talk about. But this is a civil rights problem. Blacks commit homicide at eight times the rate of whites and Hispanics combined. And if you take Hispanics out of the equation, you get an 11 to 1 homicide differential. It is violent crime that is driving the prison population. And I'll tell you this, it is also not drug enforcement that is driving the black incarceration rate. If you took out all drug prisoners from the state and federal prisons, the percentage of black prisoners would go down from 37.4% to 37.2%. In other words, it would have no effect whatsoever. So the solution is as, as our, our, our friend Pete says, <laughs> did I pronounce it right? It's like it's it's just, is to Pete. get yeah. kids not getting involved in crime in the first place. Well, I think, uh, like, even uh, with the black and white thing, yeah, but, like, this is coming from somebody, like, like I'm a comic, so I totally, like, now I look and I try to just kind of deconstruct what's going on. So even beyond race, right, beyond race, I don't really see black... I, I, I don't want to say I don't see black and white, because that's corny, but I do see poverty. And I do, I remember before I met my first black friend that didn't come from the hood, I was like, everybody's not fucked up. <laughs> I thought everybody in the hood, everybody like that was black just didn't have come from like, it just, so that kind of showed me like, dude, it's where I'm at. Cause you go with, where these crimes are, they're happening in a certain place. It's not like there's black, there's a bunch of black people killing each other in Bel Air. There's not a bunch of black people killing each other in fucking Gramercy or Chelsea. That would Chelsea. be an amazing season That's of Fresh Prince. That's what I'm saying. This is in the hood. These are people that are fucking poor, that live under the worst circumstances, below the poverty line, and it just... It's, and they the, don't have fathers. I mean, that, to me, is the biggest deal, is the breakdown I mean, I, of the family. I mean, It's like, yeah, it's no, just, it's society. That, it, it's, 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 no, well, if you but had, the question is, the hood did not parents, rise by magic be, beans. Like... The hood didn't just like emerge one day and like, oh look, all these fatherless people with no values who kill each other just, oh, they just all of a sudden emerge in this same 20 square block area. Like there are root causes to this that go beyond just bad values and like, you know, being violent. These, these things, these, these incubators were not, did not come out of, out of magic or coincidence. When I, when I said that Heather was right, and she, by the way, all these numbers, all correct. And, and um, I mean that. I, when I said it's not about race, uh, I meant it's not about race in the way that a lot of us think it is. Why these particular people fill these black markets, why gang members are overwhelmingly black and Latino has everything to do with race and racism and the history of this country, right? So let's make something illegal. Meanwhile, let's enslave a whole population and segregate them, then make sure they don't get any jobs and no property, and tell them all the while, you're not an American, you'll never be an American, you're inferior to us. Let's see uh, what happens. And then, and then <laughs> let's say, see your birth say, certificate. And then say, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna make this thing like gambling, a game, illegal, because that's what good Americans do. You're not even capable of that shit. What do you think your answer would be to that, your response to that? it would be fuck the police, wouldn't it? It would be fuck this law because that's, that makes sense, isn't it? Doesn't it, right? So that's, that, I, that is why you had not just black people, but immigrants of every stripe, and I mean color, including Irish and Italians and Jews, as they came here before they were assimilated, before they were allowed in and given full citizenship, they were the ones who filled those black markets, right? So the gangsters who, who were in the middle of prohibition in the 10s and 20s and 30s, Jews and Italians, 
right? Not, not even black people, not Mexicans, Jews and Italians. And it goes further back in the 19th century, it was all Irish. They were the heads of the gangs of New York who in this very neighborhood used to kill people like gangsters are doing now, right? Bec and what were they doing? They were running prostitution rings. They were running gambling rings. It's the same shit, okay? So racism and race have everything to do with the long story, no doubt about it. It's just not now, and the, and the laws that were passed recently weren't an effort, as Heather said, to, you know, it wasn't some grand conspiracy to lock up black people. It was this grand conspiracy to control all people, right? That's the problem. Black people and immigrants, before they were assimilated, were the ones who said, hey, being controlled the way that Americans say it's good to be controlled doesn't sound like much fun to me. And that law makes no sense to me. And that, to me, explains why the color of these people is what it is. All right, um, cool. On that punchline, we will <laughs> uh, wrap up. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming out. Thank you. All right. We want to thank all of our guests, J.L. Colvin, Thaddeus Russell, Heather McDonald, Pite Abreu. Uh, um, please check us out uh, online, uh, unsafespaceshow.com. Uh, we are uh, produced by We The Internet TV. We uh, release uh, sketch comedy videos uh, every week. Uh, check us out on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, on the website, we'll have links to, um, to all the people you saw uh, tonight. And uh, thank you so much. Let's keep the conversation going. Uh, we're probably going to go get drinks downstairs in the bar. No, sir, you're done. <laughs> you, are, you have no more questions. <laughs> no, no, well, we, we, could talk, uh, we, could, we could talk later. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Also, yeah, we have an email sign-up sheet and some free stuff to give away on that side. So come see us there, too. Cool. Thank you. Cheers.